are managed by somebody we call, refer to as a stud bookkeeper um, and they will decide which collections they go to so when they reach maturity um they'll they'll decide where they go and who they pair up with um so that they can have little ones of their own and finally mark are you optimistic that we'll get to a tipping point with the humboldt penguin where numbers will go up again We'd, we would certainly hope so. It's going to take a lot of collaboration with, with various governments and, and conservation NGOs, um, but, but something has to change. And, uh, uh, but that's, that's a part that everybody can play. I mean, conserva uh, sorry, conservation, climate change is something that we can all impact uh, and, and change for the better. So um, all those little things that will well, help these guys. It would be such a shame to lose them, wouldn't it, forever, Mark? Let's have a look at you again as we say goodbye. I bet you're tempted today to hop into that pool, aren't you? I'm very tempted, yeah. It's a, a lovely, warm, sunny day here and that water does look particularly uh, gin crisp today. Enjoy and enjoy those chicks. They're absolutely beautiful. Congratulations. on the menu today. Great food. Oh, I love it. Great dips. This is incredible. Just throw on everything. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Kickstart your weekend with Saturday Kitchen Live. Saturdays at 10 on BBC One and iPlayer. It's a £2 billion business built on fighting the establishment and living by a punk ethos. Behind their meteoric rise, there was a culture crisis brewing. I was in a really bad place. I was in shock. Good Ship Brewdog. Listen on BBC Sounds. Welcome to Sunday Morning on BBC One Scotland. At the later time of 10.15, we join Martin Geisler for the Sunday show. Now lots to discuss on Sunday Morning. So it begins. While Boris Johnson glowers from behind the black door at number 10, the beauty parade has begun outside. The only question now, who can win enough support within the Conservative Party to become its next leader and the Prime Minister? The candidates are already lining up with their Brexit badges, their service records, their promises of low taxes and a booming economy all in hand. Meanwhile, inflation keeps rising. The cost of bills, food and fuel keep climbing. And millions are worrying about how they're going to make ends meet. Over the next weeks, we'll be scrutinising the men and women who want to become our next Prime Minister. You won't want to miss it. Eight MPs have thrown the hats in the ring so far this morning. We have the two latest candidates. Sajid Javid's resignation on Tuesday evening sparked the rapid unravelling of Boris Johnson's premiership. Now the former Health Secretary, Chancellor and Home Secretary wants the top job. As does Jeremy Hunt, Britain's longest serving Health Secretary who also served as Foreign and Culture Secretary. He spent the whole of Boris Johnson's premiership on the back benches. Will that help his pitch? Across the party divide, should the Labour be asking the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper? And as millions of people prepare to fly off this summer, Willie Walsh, former boss of British Airways, who now represents the airline industry around the world, will tell us why going on holiday has got so much harder. Reviewing the news on a fantastically busy morning, Ian Dale, the LBC presenter who presided over the hustings for the previous Tory leadership elections where Boris Johnson won out and the new political editor of The Sun on Sunday, Kate Ferguson. There is so much to fit in that we have extended the programme and will be on until 10.15 this morning. So please stay with us as we begin the news with Roger Johnson. Thank you, Sophie. Good morning. Pledges on taxes and spending have been placed at the heart of the race to become the next Conservative leader. Two former health secretaries are the latest senior figures to launch their bids. Sajid Javid and Jeremy Hunt say that they will help households and businesses with the rising cost of living by cutting taxes. The plans put them at odds with the former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, who is also among the eight contenders to have declared so far. 
Thousands of pro-choice activists have gathered in the U.S. Capitol to protest against the recent Supreme Court decision which gave individual states the ability to ban terminations. The demonstrators marched through Washington, D.C. to put further pressure on the government to protect abortion rights. Last week, President Exception and pills which end pregnancies. Thousands of people descended on the largest city, Colombo. The Prime Minister's home was also set on fire after months of anger over economic mismanagement. Neither the Prime Minister nor the President were in the buildings at the time. Sri Lanka is suffering rampant inflation and is struggling to import food, fuel and medicine among the, amongst the country's worst financial crisis in 70 years. Novak Djokovic will attempt to win a fourth consecutive men's singles title on centre court at Wimbledon this afternoon. His opponent, Nick Kyrgios, is aiming for a first Grand Slam singles title. The Australian player has been fined repeatedly for his behaviour on court. The final is live on BBC One at two o'clock this afternoon. The next news here is at one o'clock. Now, back to you, Sophie. Roger, thank you very much. Let's have a look at the papers. There is an awful lot in them this morning. The Sunday Telegraph is the uh, first one we can look at. Javid and Hunt call for massive cuts to taxation. The former Chancellor wants to scrap national insurance tax rise. Help for large and small businesses is the priority for the former Foreign Secretary. We will be talking to both of them on this programme shortly. Elsewhere in the papers, The Observer, main front page there, Bitter Johnson trying to wreck Rishi Sunak's bid to replace him. He is seen as the front runner at the moment. And uh, The Observer says that the disgraced leader, Boris Johnson, is intent on revenge. Other newspaper front pages, The Mail, Liz Truss, I will spike Sunak's tax hike is her main is the main story there. And uh, Liz Truss, who hasn't yet formally announced her uh, bid to become the next prime minister, is expected to do it very shortly in the next day or two. The Sunday Times, their main story, the Tories tear themselves apart over tax. The frontrunner Sunak attacked from all sides. And it also says that uh, Nazim Zahawi is under investigation by the HMRC. The Sunday Express, new battle to save Brexit, is their headline. I must also mention there the Duchess of Cambridge, who is in all the papers this morning at Wimbledon. Her brings a smile uh, to Wimbledon. And finally, the mirror, Keir Starmer, bring on the general election. He calls for an end to zombie government, uh, is their Labour leader exclusive. Well... With me to do, review the papers, Ian Dale, the presenter on LBC, and Kate Ferguson, who is shortly, in a month, to be political editor of The Sun um, on Sunday. I don't think I'm right in saying that. <laughs> Good morning to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. I mean, what a lot to get through. Extraordinary array in the newspapers this morning. And you would like to start with? We're going to start with tax. Mail on Sunday, uh, headline, Liz Truss, I'll spike Sunak's ta tax hike. And that's what most of the candidates are saying. They're trying to portray themselves as massive tax cutters, despite most of them having been in a cabinet that has put taxes up to the highest level in, in decades. Uh, and none of them are explaining how they're going to pay for this. Um, some of them, is, some of their pr promises have been costed at about £40 billion. Pounds. Well, that's a huge amount of money. It's nearly as much as we spend on the whole of the defence budget every Every year. So I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on the issue of tax. But I mean, Liz Truss, she's seen as possibly the main challenger to Rishi Sunak at the moment. And both of those two are going to go hammer and tongs and may, may well knock each other out, actually, in the end. And Liz Truss, we're expecting her to announce that she is running in the next 24 hours. Uh, national insurance, a reversal of that, is, is one of her main, the main planks of her campaign. Yeah, exactly. As Ian says, most people, well, basically all the candidates are going to go hard on that they're going to cut tax. The only candidate that's not is Rishi Sunak, which is perhaps a bit obvious given he was Chancellor and they were raising tax. There's slight variation in what they're saying. Most of them is pro promising to cut corporation tax. So this big push to get businesses to come and invest here. Obviously, our economy is shrinking at the moment. Desperate need to put rocket boosters under it. Dividing lines about whether or not you cut income tax next year, fuel duty and the NICS hike. So Liz saying she'll spike the NICS hike. 
I think Saj is saying that too, which is mm. interesting because he was health secretary when it was being brought in. Um, but Jeremy Hunt, who I think you're speaking to later, saying that that's going to be kept. Certainly, if you spike that hike, you have to find tens of billions of pounds for the NHS, which basically at the moment means more borrowing, doesn't it? I think one of the key things they're all trying to do is they're all trying to say, I am an extinct, instinctive tax cutter. I believe in a low tax economy. Now, that's what you would expect a Conservative to think. But now Rishi Sunak is doing something very different. He's not trying to signal that at all. He's saying, look, we've, we've done this for a reason and I'm going to be the responsible Prime Minister. Now, the, I think he's the front runner at the moment, but that's a very risky strategy for him to adopt because it allows people like Nadim Zahawi, who uh, also will be standing, um, the, the current Chancellor, to portray himself in a very, very different light. And if Rishi Sunak wins, you can't really imagine Nadim Zahawi then being able to stay on as Chancellor. Give us just a sense of the timeline of all this, because we've already got eight people who have, eight MPs who have said that they're going to run. Liz Truss would be the ninth tomorrow. How quickly is this going to be sorted? It could be very quickly, actually, because th there will probably be about a dozen candidates. Penny Morden will be announcing either today or, or tomorrow, and there may well be another, another couple. Now, the 22 committee are meeting on Monday to set the timetable. It's likely that the first round of voting will be on Wednesday or Thursday, maybe even Tuesday, but probably Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but there's going to be quite a high threshold. You're going to have to get about 25 MPs, otherwise you'll drop out automatically, even if you don't necessarily come bottom. So it could be that by the end of next week, when Parliament uh, finishes, I think it's on the 22nd of July, yeah. you could, you'll have the final two. Now, the key then, I, I don't know whether, Kate, you agree with this, but the key then is if the front runner, say they get 270 votes and then the second one only gets, say, 70, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the second one to just say, OK, well, I, I'm going to drop out now. And then we could have the new Prime Minister by the 22nd of July. It might not go to the Tory party membership. I'm not saying that will happen, but it's a, certainly a possibility. And how many of them do you think will get the 25 you need? Gosh, yeah, but if it, what we're expecting, about a dozen, it'd be a massive bun fight at the beginning of the week. I reckon you probably get about mm, seven that might be able to get the signatures. But I think you'll see that whittle down quite quickly. So, yes, low, everyone and their dog seems to be running at the moment, but by the end of next week, whittle down to two. And who do you think so, will be gone by next week? I mean, extraordinary how quickly this is all moving. No, we never imagined we'd be here where we are a week really ago when I was sitting here. to say, because Tom Tugendhat is seen as one of the outsiders, but he hit the ground running on Thursday, Friday, uh, got a decent number of MPs to support him to get, begin with, one or two quite good names. Now, it's all about momentum. Remember George H. W. Bush used to call it the Big Mo? Well, Tom Tugan had, had that. Then Rishi Sunak had it. So it all depends on who can keep up that momentum. And you've got one or two of the so-called fringe candidates who are actually building up quite a bit of support. Now, it all depends on where that support goes. When they drop out, who does that transfer to? Suella Braveman, for example. I don't think people think she's going to reach the final two. But her support will probably transfer lock, stock and barrel to Liz Truss. So it's all about these machinations, calculations. I'm going to put you both on the spot. Who's going to win? Oh, gosh. Um, I, One I person. Well, I think we might be looking at our first BME PM. I'll say that. I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think that Penny Mordaunt, um, when, when she announces it's going to be very interesting, her platform, I think if she hits the ground running, she could do quite well. Whether she'll get to the final two, not so sure. And as you can tell, I'm filling time because I can't, get, I can't give you one. But I, I think... It is I wide think, open, though. It is wide open, open, yeah. The fact is, of the 12 candidates, five are from an ethnic minority background, five are female. Now, mm. that is quite something. Thing, I think for a modern day Conservative Party. They had the first woman Prime Minister, they had the first Jewish Prime Minister. I think Kate is, is quite right. They could now be getting the first ethnic minority Prime Minister. But it's, uh, it's going to be quite a, a, it's going to be a tough fight, isn't it? I mean, there's a story in, is it the Telegraph or the it's Sunday, like Sunday Times, Times yeah. about the dirty dossiers? Yeah, so, it, I mean, most leadership most leadership contenders haven't even launched properly yet and already the sort of gloves are off and we're getting talk and briefing in the papers of dirty dossiers. So the Sunday Times has quite a colourful piece here where they talk about kind of lurid sex allegations against some of the candidates. There's talk that rival teams have been secretly meeting Labour opponents in 
pubs in Westminster to pass over this kind of compromise on their opponents. It's all quite lurid. I think... No evidence for it at all. <laughs> I mean, have you been getting dirty dossiers well, from the campaigns? There's always, there's always rumours that go around, aren't there? There's always rumours that go around. And I think we've been expecting this leadership contest for a little while, yeah. haven't we? Yes. Have, you, have you had any of the dirty dossiers yet? No. And I, I... Look, I was involved in the 2005 campaign when I was working for David Davis. And, and there were five different candidates then. That, there was a lot of camaraderie among the campaigns in that. There was, there was no sort of dirty tricks. In fact, when there was a dirty trick story about David Cameron and, uh, and drugs, uh, David Davis went to squash it immediately. It didn't come from us, nothing to do with that, and it genuinely wasn't. So I take a lot of this, frankly, with a pinch of salt. It, some of it is the sort of thing that happens in campaigns. There will always be one or two renegades who do silly things. Yeah, and what, certainly it's mainly gossip, I think. What about Boris Johnson? He's at Chequers this weekend. There's uh, a piece in The Telegraph about whether, about him considering his political future. I don't know if we've got the piece it's here. here. It's yeah. somewhere here. <laughs> it is somewhere. Basically, anyway, that's what it says. We know that Boris has gone to Chequers this weekend, and the big, the big decision facing him is how long does he stay an MP, and does he continue with his political career? Now he's no longer going to be leader and PM. It sounds like he's weighing up whether or not he's going to continue in politics. We don't expect him to stand down and spark a by-election, though. So certainly he will be here for at least a couple more years, it looks like. And I, I think Tim Shipman's got a long read on this, too, today, oh, sorry, it's here, there we go, um, where he talks about the era being the age of Boris. Boris was obviously such a huge dominant political force, could connect with voters like no other politician could. Mm -hmm. Spearheaded Brexit, got Brexit done famously, tore down that once impenetrable red wall of Labour. And I think the big question for Tory leadership candidates is, in a way, like, how much of the Boris legacy do they continue with? And on that, I don't necessarily mean strip policies on tax or what you spend your money on, but do they continue that realignment with the Red Wall? Do they continue to think they can bridge the Red Wall and the, that Southern Blue Wall? And I think certainly whoever the next leader, leader is, they will have... He will cast a long shadow over them in or terms she, of his... Or she. Over them, oh, yes, he, as in Boris, oh, right, yeah. Right, right. Um, in terms of his ability to connect and inspire the country. Yeah, he's the most consequential prime minister of my adult life, says uh, Tim Shipman. He also says in the same article that Boris Johnson is the. What does he say? He's the third prime. He's the, Boris Johnson he's the has third prime minister to be brought down by, by, Boris, by Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Yeah. So well, I, I think this is a really interesting piece in the Sunday Times because the, the conventional narrative is that Boris Johnson has been the worst prime minister since Anthony Eden, and you can make an argument for that in some ways. But he is a consequential prime minister. He's somebody who Tony Benn would have described as um, a, 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 a signal prime minister, not a weather vane. Somebody who changed the political weather. And whether you like him or you hate him, whether you rate him or you don't, you can't deny that he has changed this country for good or bad, whatever your views, not just because of Brexit, but one or two other big, mm -hmm. big ticket issues as well. Uh, while all this was happening uh, on Wednesday, while Boris Johnson was standing in Downing Street, um, there was uh, Sir Keir Starmer mm. at Wimbledon. And there's lots of coverage, obviously, <laughs> in the papers this morning about the, the women's final, um, and which has basically essentially been won by a Russian. Oh, there we are. Um, it has, and of course today we've got, as the Sunday Times are calling it, Nasty Nick and Novak, Novak, all set for the bad boy final. So that, that, that sort of set that up. Um, I don't know about you, but I, mean, I used to go to Wimbledon every year. I haven't been for a long time, but I've kind of rediscovered my love of tennis this year. Similarly with Test Cricket, help being off with Covid for three weeks, so I had time <laughs> to watch it. But I think this has been a great summer of sports so far and it's going to continue. What about you, Kate? Yeah, I mean, a great summer of sports, certainly, but is this the most unpopular Wimbledon final? I don't know. Then two men, not hugely popular. I think some of the Wimbledon oh, crowd will really be. It's, going to, it's <laughs> certainly going to be dramatic, though. Fireworks, I think. Well, I think we can certainly expect that. Well, um, thank you both very much for now, because I know we're obviously talking to both uh, Jeremy Hunt and Sajid Javid, and I know you're going to be staying with us, and uh, we'll be joining me again at the end. So I look forward to talking to you then. Let's have a look at the latest weather, though, with Sarah Keith-Lucas. Good morning. 
Good morning to you, Sophie. Well, temperatures are going to be building over the next few days, so many areas will reach the heat wave criteria. This is the picture this morning in Hampshire. Blue skies above the beautiful poppy field there. And really for the rest of today, we're looking at things not changing very much. Strong sunshine coming through, and it's going to be feeling very warm, particularly across parts of southern and southeastern England. But right across the board, we're looking at above average temperatures. A little bit more cloud through some Irish Sea coasts and to the north and northwest of Scotland, but most of that cloud burning back through the day. So the warmest spots will be down towards London in the southeast, 30 degrees or so here, but even further north, we're looking at 22 to 24 degrees for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. And of course, for the men's final at Wimbledon today, it is going to be a hot one on Centre Court with temperatures reaching close to 30 degrees. This evening, a warm, sunny end to the day, and then it's looking dry and settled overnight tonight. There'll be a bit of patchy mist of fog forming here and there, with temperatures sitting between about 11 to 16 degrees first thing tomorrow. But tomorrow, we've got more of the same. It is going to be another sunny, dry day. A bit more cloud ahead of a weather front in the far northwest, a bit breezier here. But in that strong sunshine, we're going to see temperatures up to... 32, possibly 30 degrees in the hottest spots in the southeast, still above average further north too, and things looking largely dry and pretty warm for much of the week ahead. Sophie. Sarah, thank you. Jeremy Hunt has spent the whole of Boris Johnson's premiership on the backbenches. A former culture secretary, then health secretary, then foreign secretary. He has plenty of experience in government, but does he have what it takes to lead the party and heal the wounds? He joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. Do you think the very fact that you have not served in Boris Johnson's government helps you in this contest? In one important way, yes, because there are a lot of very angry voters after what's happened in the last few months, and they're not going to come back to us automatically, and choosing me would be a very strong signal uh, that the Conservative Party has listened to that anger. But... Um, the reason I'm putting my name forward is not that. It is because the two biggest challenges we face as a country now are the international crisis in Ukraine and an economy teetering on the brink of recession. And I am the experienced Foreign Secretary who is also an entrepreneur who will get the economy going. Um, and I also recognise that the leader of a political party has to win elections, and that means a broad appeal. So just as Tony Blair had John Prescott to, to broaden his appeal as his Deputy Prime Minister, I will have Esther McVeigh as my Deputy Prime Minister. She's won a lot of elections against Labour in the North. I've won them against Lib Dems in the South. And I think we will be a formidable campaigning team. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but I want to stay with the, the subject of Boris Johnson, because last time you were here, I asked you whether the Prime Minister was an honest man, and you said at the time it wasn't helpful. Now is all about being honest and straightforward and telling people what, what, what you really think. And can you give me a straight answer now? Is Boris Johnson an honest man? Well, I think he did some things that were not honest, and that's why we're in the situation we're in. But I hesitated before, and I don't really want to go down this road now, because I don't think it helps uh, the reputation of politics for politicians to dwell too much on personal failings. I think the country realised things had gone wrong. The Conservative Party acted, and we now need to look forward. And there are so many big challenges that we need to focus on, uh, which you were just discussing earlier, um, tax cuts and growing the economy and so on. I think we need to focus the debate that happens now on those issues. So you say he's done things that are not honest. You have been far away on the back benches throughout his whole time. Have, should people who have served in his cabinet, who have been with him right up until the end, should they be disqualified from this process because they've been so closely associated with him? No. And I think people will make a judgment as to the extent to which people distance themselves from what went on. Um, but no, I wouldn't say that at all. What I do think is that the electorate need to know, voters, not all voters, but the voters who were particularly angered by what happened, need to know that we've listened and we understand that anger and that we've changed, but also we have a plan for the future. I think one of the things that we didn't hear enough of uh, from the government that we've just had is what is our long-term plan for the economy, what's our long-term plan for the NHS and so on. But how, how can people who have served in Boris Johnson's cabinet right till the very end have seen, be seen to be listening and have changed already? Sophie, I haven't come on here to uh, badmouth other people putting their hat in the ring. I think we have some formidably talented people. Uh, what we need to be doing is having a big debate about how we're going to get the economy on its feet. I've spent a long time, as you know, as health secretary. I think one of the big 
questions we have is how we're going to pay for the NHS and the care system and lower people's taxes. As someone who uh, set up their own business, I strongly believe that it's about growth. And my business was a technology business. I think we've got a big opportunity to become the world's next Silicon Valley, uh, just as Nigel Lawson did for the City of London, turning it into a giant financial centre. And use our Brexit freedoms to do that. Okay. So forgive me for talking about that, no, but I think that no, no, is I want, the... I want to talk about this in detail, but I just want to get one thing clear as well, because and what do you say to people? You know, Boris, what, Boris Johnson has gone, very dramatic fashion. Um, what do you say to people who say that he was the Prime Minister who won the elections, he got the big decisions done, he got us through coronavirus, he negotiated a Brexit deal, he got the big calls right. That is what a lot of people will say. And he says that the herd moved and that is why he's gone. What do you say to people who say that he was deposed by ambitious people like you who, who want to run the country, who want to replace him? Well, I don't think that's what happened. And um, he did get sought out some big things. We were in a constitutional quagmire with Brexit. Uh, he gave uh, a hung parliament a, a clear government with a majority, which was, I think, very important in the pandemic. But he got other things wrong. And in the end, the Conservative Party listened to its voters. Listened, we listened to our constituents. And we decided that things had to change. And I think that was the right thing to do. But I think we want to build on the things he did get right and look forward. Was he a good Prime Minister? I think there were some things he did that were good. I mean, you know, in my area of health, the, the vaccine programme was a tremendous success. But obviously other things were very disappointing and, you know, made many of my voters in South West Surrey extremely angry. And that's why we need a new chapter. Let's talk about tax, because that is one of your big uh, plans. And we've looked through your tax and pl spend plans that you have announced this morning. What we have looked at and found is that it's big tax cuts for business, not big tax cuts for families. What about the families who are trying to make ends meet? Well, no Conservative should offer unfunded tax cuts. And I think no Conservative should raise taxes either. Um, what you need are smart tax cuts that will grow the economy. And corporation tax, I think that... You know, I set up my business because Nigel Lawson, Margaret Thatcher, uh, created a pro-enterprise environment. I was actually the only one of my friends leaving university who went off and set up their own business. Um, and I want more people to do that. But if we're going to increase corporation tax, which is one of the biggest taxes businesses pay, so that it's more than not just Japan and America, but more than France and Germany, then people won't want to set up businesses. So but that's that's great for businesses who will. That's see great a, for everyone, Sophie. Because it was great once for you businesses, but for families who are trying to make ends meet right now, what are they going to get? Well, we need to look at every support that we can give for cost of living. I haven't. Uh, announced what I want to do on that yet, but... So what, you have but, plans for, for yes, uh, tackling but, cost of living, but, you have something. But, but um, when you cut people's personal taxes, which I passionately believe we must, it must be forever. And that means it must be sustainable on the basis of growth in the economy. And that, that the priority, if we're going to do that, is to get the economy growing. Next year, we are scheduled to have the lowest growth of any major country except Russia. And that's what we have to turn around. That's what, with my business background, I want to really change. But you are saying that you are going to announce plans shortly for cost of living, something that will affect people trying to make ends meet. You are going to have other plans. It's not just about big business. My plans are not about big business at all. My plans are about growing the economy because the fundamental reason that people vote Conservative is because uh, we will deliver prosperity and mean that people's family finances are secure and the economy is not growing now. And so it's, it's about making sure that we have that growth that means that we can fund the NHS and deliver personal tax cuts. There is a problem, isn't there, with your growth argument. The OBR says tax cuts for businesses might boost growth in some ways, but not enough to pay for themselves. Tax cuts don't improve the long-term finances. Are you going to be straight with people that actually your tax cuts will make the economy weaker and people poorer? That's not the case at all. And I was in the uh, cabinet uh, where George Osborne cut corporation tax. Treasury figures show that uh, you get about half the cost of corporation tax back because of increased economic activity. Um, and if we uh, keep the cycle, uh, keep the fiscal rules we have, but increase the length of the cycle to, to five years, we can afford these tax cuts, but what you get is the growth. Uh, and, you know, that in the end 
is what people want from a Conservative government, to know that the economy is growing healthily. And that, that's that is not the bit really that's missing. Happened, has it? For the last years, few years, it's not really happened. Well, it hasn't happened in the last few years, and that's why I'm standing, because I want to change it. But if you remember, when I was responsible for the London Olympics, uh, people were worried we were in a triple-dip recession. And then over the, the two years that followed, we turned ourselves into the fastest-growing major economy. And we did it by making sure that we had the most competitive business environment. And that, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have particular retail appeal, Sophie, but it is the fundamental thing that will get the economy on its feet. You know that cutting taxes is, is inflationary. Does inflation not matter anymore? I don't agree with that when it comes to business taxes. If you stimulate consumer demand, uh, when there's some demand-led inflation, there is that risk, but we must bear down on inflation. So that's why I'd be very careful not to promise cuts that uh, would stoke inflation. The IFS say all taxes, all tax cuts are inflationary, and, it, and that is the impact it will have. Inflation is, is already running at 9%. It's set to go to 11%. Does it not matter if it goes up further? It, it matters greatly, and that's why I'm very careful. I think if you look at what the IFS say in detail, uh, they will say that different taxes have different impact. But I'm very clear that tackling inflation has to be the main challenge. I'm going to be talking to Sajid Javid later on in the programme, and your plans are far less ambitious than his. He's talking about cutting in income tax next year. He's cutting about, talking about cutting fuel duty further. He's talking about reversing the national insurance rise. Are you being unambitious or is he being unrealistic? Well, it's a nicely worded question, but I think the, the, the truth is that uh, we both want to be <coughs> ambitious and I have a great deal of respect for Sajid, but I am the person who has more experience in the Cabinet than any other uh, person who's entering this race and I have learned over the years that you must only make promises that you can keep and the number one priority with me with my business experience is to get the economy growing and that's why not necessarily the most retail tax cuts but the things that will boost business make us an attractive business environment use our Brexit freedoms uh, to turn ourselves into the world's next Silicon Valley those are the things that will make a real difference. What about defence spending? Uh, you want to increase defence spending. How much is that going to cost? You want to increase it to 3% of GDP? Yes, and that's over a 10-year period. And much of that is in procurement, which wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't end up having to pay the bills until the second half of that period. And that's another reason why we've got to get economic growth. But security abroad... And my father was an officer in the Navy, and um, the reason I think that's important is because Britain has always had a special role in the world as a defender of freedom and democracy, and I want us to continue that role. What about health spending? I mean, the NHS is going to be costing 44% of day-to-day -day public service spending by the next election. Is the NHS overfunded? No, I think we have to be honest with people that we are, as we grow older, going to need more money to be spent on health and care and that doesn't matter if you're in America your insurance premiums will go up uh, wherever you are that is the case so you're but, not going to be able but to hang, I mean, let, let me just answer your question the, the, the thing that has been missing in our health policies is that it isn't just about money it's about reform it's about whether we're training enough doctors for the future it's about whether we're putting in the IT systems that cut down waste it's whether we go back to people having their own GPs and that's the way that we'll make sure that, our, uh, that we actually get the value for money uh, that keeps the health budget sustainable. A lot of this campaign is going to be about being straightforward and honest with the voters. So let's talk about tax affairs. Uh, have, any, have you or any members of your immediate family ever benefited from non-DOM status? No. Do you think all candidates should publish their tax affairs just so that they are being straight with the British public? Well, I'm very happy um, if I proceed to the final two to publish my tax affairs if, um, if that's what both candidates do. But I'm not going to speak for other candidates, but for myself I would have no problem doing so. What about uh, Brexit? In the referendum you backed Remain. During the negotiations you wanted to stay in the single market. During your last leadership pitch you were prepared to leave without a deal. Do you have real gut instincts on Brexit or do you just blow with the wind? I voted Remain because I was worried about the risks but I have never doubted for one moment that we can make a huge success of being outside the European Union. And we have now left the European Union. So the question now is not Brexit, that's settled. The question is who can make the most success 
of Brexit. And that's why I think we need to have a, a long-term plan that, for example, uses the, the freedom we have, total control over our own regulations, to make Britain the best place for clinical trials, for driverless cars, for uh, innovations in, in making and food. And that's the kind of thing which will make Brexit a terrific success. Let me just ask you a couple of really quick, quick yes or no questions, so, so people really get a sense of what you're doing. Is it right to send asylum seekers to Rwanda? I think we have to stop the small boats. I support the current policy. Are you committed to reaching net zero by 2050? Yes. Uh, will you scrap the BBC licence fee? No. Uh, are there any circumstances under which you would allow another referendum on Scottish independence? Um, not in the next 10 years. Uh, lockdown? Would you ever lock the country down again? Not for a Covid-like virus because we have vaccines and that means you don't need to. Uh, the problem that you have as a candidate is that you are seen as a safe pair of hands but some will say you've got no big ideas, you're not being as radical as Sajid Javid, you haven't got the, exciter, the exciting plans ahead uh, to take the country forward. Is that the problem that your party and the country have moved on from politicians like you? I hope not and that's why I'm standing because I want to make the case that when you have that experience that is a tremendous asset for the Prime Minister of our country and what I think people know me as is someone who is a, as a patriot, uh, someone who knows how to unleash the incredible potential that we have as a country but someone who will always be straight about the trade-offs that we have to get there. And we've been a country that has been willing to do difficult things to unleash the, the greatness that we have within, and I want to carry on on um, that journey. Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much for talking to us this morning. And while you've been talking to us, there are now nine of you in the fray because Penny Mordaunt has just announced her intention to stand alongside you as well. Jeremy Hunt, thank you. And we will, of course, be hearing from another leadership candidate, Sajid Javid, just before the end of the programme, so do stay with us for that. Now to something completely different. If you tried to fly off on holiday over half term, you will remember the queues, the huge delays, the cancellations at airports. It has led to a war of words between the airlines and the government as to who is at fault. The airlines for sacking too many staff during the early stages of the pandemic or the government for creating uncertainty around travel during the COVID years. There is a solution, although it's not clear it really benefits consumers. The government has allowed airlines to give back some of the precious sl slots when their aircraft can take off and land at airports. The consequence of that, tens of thousands of cancelled flights. Well, Willie Walsh ran BA's parent company, IAG, until 2020. He's now the Director General of the International Air Transport Association, which represents airlines around the world. And he joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. Let's talk about the problems that people are going to, to have in front of them just for this summer alone. Summer holidays start shortly. How many people are going to miss out on their holidays because of all the cancellations that are being announced? Well, I think it's important to put it into context. It's yeah. not at every airport and it's not with every airline. In fact, many airports around Europe are functioning perfectly well. Uh, there have been some challenges in the UK. Uh, it's well documented. Manchester had problems in the early stages. Heathrow certainly has difficulties at the moment. They're not meeting their basic standards and it's clear that they can't as they go forward. I think it is right though that these cancellations are made early because at least that will allow airlines and their customers to adapt to the revised schedules. So I, I actually expect people to be able to get away. Uh, I think there will be some disruption, but I don't think it's on the scale that we've seen today. And I believe that there are solutions being put in place. But in far, as far as BA goes, for example, and you ran BA for a long time, mm. of course, BA have announced another 10,000 plus uh, cancellations. People now who have flights booked this summer, they may not know yet that their flights have been cancelled. Well, I would hope that those flights that are being cancelled will be announced very quickly. In fact, but I'm they surprised. haven't been announced. I, yeah, yet, I'm, have surprised. They? I, I'm surprised. I'm uh, surprised that they haven't been announced. Certainly, I believe it, they should have announced it as soon as they made clear that they would be cancelling. The thing you've got to remember is a lot of these flights will have very low bookings at this stage. The lead-in time for bookings has changed significantly over the past two years, and in many cases, I would imagine that you would have less than 20% of the seats on some of those flights actually booked. So I don't believe airlines will have a difficulty accommodating the people that have made bookings. But people's holiday plans will be changed undoubtedly. Are people going to lose money over this? I, I, no, most definitely not. You know, airlines and airports, I think, have been clear that the, uh, the customer 
the individuals who will be impacted by this should not suffer financially. So flights are not going to get more expensive just because there are fewer? No, I think flights are getting more expensive because of the high price of oil. And it's been clear to everybody that uh, that will be reflected in higher ticket prices. Uh, so, you know, the demand is strong. Uh, it's not as strong as it was in 2019. It is improving, but we're still quite a distance behind where we were in 2019. May was at about 67 percent of 2019. So there's still a gap between supply and demand, but I think it will close as we go through the summer. But, but the basic line, the bottom line, is that flying is going to be more expensive for consumers. Flying will be more expensive for consumers, without doubt. As I said, if you look at record oil prices, uh, uh, oil is the single biggest element of an airline's cost base. It's inevitable that ultimately the high oil prices will be passed through to consumers and higher tickets. But people prices. whose flights are cancelled now, British Airways for example, will they have to pay more to rebook? Well, I think you're better off uh, addressing that to British Airways, but I believe they wouldn't, that they'll be accommodated on other flights that British Airways will be operating. How can airlines cope with all the compensation, the cost of this, that is, is going to be put on them? Because they're having to compensate passengers yeah. who, whose flights are cancelled. They're having to give them money. How can they survive? Well, actually, it's not new. You know, if we go back to 2019, we had cancellations in 2019. We're seeing slightly more cancellations in 2022 than we had. If I look at the first five months of 2019, about 1% of flights were cancelled within 24 four hours. For the first five months of this year, that was 1.6%. And that, that's the area that actually leads to the highest cost. So that's why I think it is better that when it's clear that the airport, in this case Heathrow, cannot cope, that schedules are adjusted now so that they can accommodate as many people as possible. I imagine they'd be able to accommodate everybody that's made a booking. And that you avoid this extreme cost that normally airlines would incur in the short term. And indeed that consumers often incur as well. A lot of the problems that we've seen already and a lot of the problems that people are, are going to face this summer are because of staffing, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the accusation is that airlines, like British Airways, and you were in charge of British Airways, Airways at least the, the parent company, yeah. IAG, at the time, that you sacked tens of thousands of staff at the start of the pandemic so that you could retire them and rehire them on, on different contracts? Well, that wasn't what happened. If you remember, British Airways actually reached agreement with their trade unions on the uh, changes that were made back you then. You were first it was to announce huge, it, it, huge redundancies, yes, 12,000. Yes, and, and in fact, you know, I have no regrets about that. If you look at what was happening April, May, June of 2020, uh, passenger numbers fell to 2%. 2% of where they were in 2019. In effect, airlines were grounded with no visibility around what was going to happen. You had politicians assuming that it would all be sorted out in a short period of time. I think airlines were absolutely right to be cautious and to take steps to ensure their survival. But some say you were ruthless in what you did. I mean, the Transport Select Committee looked at it and that they said that what happened was a calculated attempt to take advantage of the pandemic to cut jobs. The behaviour of British Airways and its parent company towards its employees is a national disgrace. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I disagree strongly with what they said. They wrote that report in May, June of 2020. The report assumed that everything would be sorted out. In fact, when I gave evidence to that committee, the uh, Corona Job uh, Retention Scheme was due to finish in, uh, I think it was in June. It was originally scheduled to last for three months. It was subsequently extended to October, and as we know, extended again beyond that. Because I think the view that many politicians held was this would be a short-term event with little or no structural change. So did, now, did, since then, since then, uh, and I, I'm, you know, I've left IAG two years ago, but if you look at it, they've lost almost eight billion euros in the period uh, since this coronavirus. Did you started. not sack too many staff, though? Is that what you're no, saying? You're no, happy no, with the no, number of staff that yeah, you lost? Yeah. And, and other airlines made similar adjustments. Ryanair is, is not having anything like the cancellations. Ryanair is absolutely all right because they didn't sack the number of staff. They but kept they, the staff. But, but that's not true. Uh, if you look at the end of March of 2020, when this started, Ryanair had 17,300 staff. In uh, March of 2021, they had 15,000. That's a 13% reduction, which is broadly similar to what I think uh, British Airways had. Uh, now, uh, you know, great credit to Ryanair, an extremely well-run airline. But their business model, in fact, was to stand down a lot of their aircraft during the off-peak. So I think, to be fair to them, they had a lot more experience of uh, ramping down and ramping up, and that they have done an excellent job. You took a big bonus, didn't you, in September 2020, what, during the pandemic, almost a million pounds, when thousands of people were losing their jobs. Was that right? No, I, I didn't take it. It was paid earlier that year, and it was paid for the results that we delivered back in 20. 
2019, which were record profits. Yes, I did. Yeah, at, at, which was uh, awarded in February, uh, I think February or March of 2020, before this started. And do you think, in retrospect, that it was right to take it, given all the problems that have built up over that time, and that we then yes, saw the results yeah, of? Yeah, no, I, I do because I'm not responsible for running the airline since I've left. I've left there two years ago. Would I have done it differently if I was running the airline now? Maybe. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, airlines around the world are doing everything they can to facilitate their customers in a very challenging environment. And governments did not help in many cases, certainly here in the UK. You know, the coronavirus uh, job retention scheme ended in May, uh, sorry, in September of 2021, when passenger traffic was still at 37% of where it was in, in 2019. Uh, first quarter of this year, passenger traffic in the UK was only at 51% of where it was in 2019. So airlines have been very hard hit. And Is it the airport's fault? I think in some cases, yes, airports, Heathrow definitely should have prepared better. They were arguing that airlines should be operating at least 80% of their slots through the summer period. They clearly did not provide sufficient resources to deal with that level of activity. So you would have to be critical of Heathrow. Can I just ask you one question about uh, disabled passengers who we mm -hmm. have seen, Frank Gardner, our BBC security correspondent, is, is, has, this has happened to him a lot, in fact, I think we've got the photograph of him there, where he arrives at an airport in the UK yeah. and he is left on that plane yeah. because there is no one there to help him uh, get off the plane. Mm. Uh, can you explain why the UK airports have a, such a terrible record on this? Well, it is the responsibility of the airport. Personally, I think it should be re the responsibility of the airline. And I think part of the problem is the disconnect between the customer sitting on board an aircraft, being managed or being looked after by an airline, but the responsibility to take that customer off the aircraft rests with the airport. And again, in this case, I don't believe they have sufficient resources. So this is an area, uh, in fact, it was EU legislation. Maybe it's an area that the government should look at changing. Willie Walsh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Now, one person who had a good week last week is the Labour leader, Sikir Starmer. At the very moment that Boris Johnson's future as Prime Minister was coming to an abrupt halt, Sikir, as you are about to see, was sitting in the Royal Box at Wimbledon enjoying the tennis. Then two days later, Durham police announced that neither he nor his deputy, Angela Rayner, had broken COVID rules. There would be no fines. His future, which had been hanging in the balance, looks safe again, or at least as safe as anything in politics is nowadays. Well, I'm joined now by Labour's Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. Good morning. Good morning. Now, most of the candidates, and we now have nine who have thrown their hats into the ring, uh, who will stand for Tory leadership, according to the polls, would do better in a general election than Boris Johnson. Is that, is that not bad news for Labour? I think it's in the national interest that Boris Johnson goes. I actually think it's really damaging him still clinging on now when everyone knows after all the lies or after all of the law breaking and even today the uh, allegations around abuse of power while he was mayor of London, all of that kind of sleaze still carrying on. And sadly, we've got, you've got a catalogue of contestants to replace him who have all been defending him for all of this time and who Jeremy have been Hunt part of... Jeremy hasn't, as he was just telling me, but anyway, But yes. many of them have, and they've all been voting for many of the policies that they're now arguing around, and also they've been part of 12 years of really damaging Conservative government that's left us with incredibly low growth, with public services being run down, and with this soaring cost of living crisis that they have really failed to address that's been hitting families across the country. That's why I think we need a Labour government. We need a proper fresh start. We need a change from the last 12 years, not just the last 12 months. And you want a general election. Are you going to push ahead for a, with a vote of no confidence this week? Well, we still hope that the Conservatives will do the right thing and get Boris Johnson out of Downing Street quickly, because I think nobody has any trust or confidence in what he might still do while he's clinging on to power. Okay, he but doesn't that doesn't look like duty. it's going to happen, so does it? So what about so that's why no we confidence. have said we think this is the right thing to do. That's why Keir said that uh, he will put that forward, because I think that there has to be a question to all of these Conservative candidates. Do they really want Boris Johnson, after everything that's happened, to be carrying on in Downing Street through all this time? So just to be clear, can we expect Labour to push for a vote of no confidence this week? That is what Keir is proposing, but we are hoping that the Conservatives will address this at their meeting tomorrow and will make sure that, that Boris Johnson leaves Downing Street now.
in order to win a vote of no confidence, you had, you'd need 37 Tory MPs around that to vote against their own government. It's not going to happen, isn't it? It's a, it's a waste of time. So shouldn't you, as the Labour Party, be devoting your time now to, to focusing on the things that really do matter to the electorate, helping people with the cost of living? We, that's exactly why we set out. We, we obviously led the argument about trying to help people with the cost of living. It's why we put forward the proposal for the windfall tax. We also argued not just for windfall tax on the um, excess profits of the oil and gas companies, but also to use that money very quickly to cut people's bills through cutting VAT on energy bills. Instead, the government's taking a much slower approach to that. We're also arguing for practical things to boost growth in the long term to also make sure that you can cut people's energy bills by insulating homes. We could be insulating two million homes this year if the government got on with the plan we set out as part of the climate change pledge. So a series of practical things but and those instead practical... we're not getting anything like that from the Conservative Party. But the practical things you're, you're outlining there are long term practical things aren't they? They're not going to help people here and now. Well, the VAT cut that we proposed would have been immediate. But so it really, that's it would only, I think, it would, would hardly be touch the sides, though, would it? Well, look, I think there's 163 got... pounds. Is that? Well, you've got to have. Well, the proposals that Labour had set out would have been up to 600 pounds for families, which would make a real difference at a time when families are under a lot of pressure. But you've also got to tackle some of the causes of what's going on with rising energy bills. That's why Rachel Reeves has set out a proposal for the Climate Investment Pledge, which is is actually about tackling at source some of the rising costs of energy and actually making sure we can also move to a cleaner, greener future. And that again Something is long again term, that we're isn't not it? hearing and from the government. And but again, it's long term. Immediately, you could help two million households pretty much straight away with their energy bills this year. Millions more are going to need help. I mean, energy they bills are, are looking like they're going up twelve hundred pounds. And we've led the argument on that, and we'll continue to do so as well. And what people want to know now, I mean, that general election is what two years away at the most what people want to know now is what the Labour Party would do tax is the big issue that is being talked about by all the Conservative candidates at the moment whether or not they're going to cut it most of them say they are what about the Labour Party the national insurance rise, for example, would you reverse that? So, as you know, we actually opposed the national insurance uh, increase. I do know that, but yeah, would you there reverse was, it? There was a reason for that. The reason we opposed it was because we thought it was just unfair to be targeting low-paid workers at a time when the cost of living was soaring. And I thought, you know, sadly, all the candidates that you've got before you who are now proposing either to change it, reverse it, or to do other sorts of things with taxes, none of them voted with us on that. And I don't think any of them have put forward any costed proposals. I'm sure you'll be asking for them for their costed proposals of what they're actually going to do. And while they've been talking about being a low tax party, they've all been voting for 15 tax rises. But at the heart of it, if you really want to do something about tax or about public spending, you've got to get growth. And at the moment, there's nothing coming from anybody in the Conservative Party about growth. And that's why Labour's plan in the end is a plan to boost growth. It's about working with businesses to support the industries of the future. It's about working on the skills, on childcare, on the things that you need to get the economy growing. But just growing specifically on tax, you, haven't, you didn't answer that. I know you said you were against it, but if you if you are the next government, will you reverse the rise in national insurance? Well, Rachel Reeves will set out what the proposals are for the manifesto, and you wouldn't expect me to prejudge what Rachel will set out actually at but the manifesto. People want to know, but, don't they? Well, now. but we've set up. Well, they'll want to know in a general election, which is when Rachel will set out costed proposals. But that's what we've done so far. And as you know, we did vote against it at a time when all of those Conservative candidates were voting for it. But we've also will set out plans for actually a fairer country. Rachel's already set out plans, for example, to get rid of the non-DOM status, which has been an issue for several of the candidates, the Conservative candidates that you had before you. But that's why I think ultimately we need a proper fresh start for the country. We're not getting that. It's more of the same from all of the, the sort of catwalk of candidates that you've got coming before you. OK, Yvette Cooper, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Now, at two minutes past six on Tuesday evening, British politics had one of those moments that will be written about for decades.
The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, pressed send on a tweet announcing his resignation. Nine minutes later, the Chancellor followed him. And over the next 48 hours, more than 60 other ministers and members of the government and Conservative Party figures went as well, culminating in Boris Johnson leaving number 10 to walk to a podium and announce that he would stand down as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Sajid Javid has stayed loyal to Boris Johnson throughout his recent troubles. He publicly defended him during Partygate. So what was the tipping point? And why does Sajid Javid think he is now the best man to lead the country? He can tell us. He is with me now. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, had you decided that you wanted to be, prime, to be Prime Minister before you sent that tweet? No. I, actually, the first time I started thinking about properly uh, resigning was uh, this time last week, actually. And... Uh, and uh, I'd been sort of struggling with this decision for a while. I'd been given the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt again and again. And then on Tuesday morning, I went to this national prayer breakfast in Parliament. And uh, sounds might sound a bit strange, but I was listening to the sermon by this amazing man, Reverend Les Isaac. You know, he started street pastors. And I was listening to him talk about the importance of integrity in public life. And uh, just focusing on that, I made up my mind. I went straight back to my office and drafted the resignation letter and went to see the Prime Minister later in the day. And it, it had the effect, um, because Rishi Sunak followed you straight after her, there are people who think that that was a coordinated decision to move. Did you speak to Rishi Sunak before you resigned? Did he know you were about to resign? Not at all, not at all. I had no idea what he was going to do, and I can understand what he did, because I read his letter afterwards, uh, but not at all. I mean, this was a decision made by me. No one, had, other than my, my closest uh, advisors in my department. No one had any idea I was going to do this. And, uh, and, and, and it, it wasn't about leadership or anything else. It was about the, the just, you know, I just think if you're, if you're working, I, was, I have the privilege of being in the cabinet and I take it very seriously. I have a very important, I had a very, very important job and I didn't want to give it up lightly because I think a lot of people were depending on me. But I think once you lose confidence mm -hmm. in, in your boss, your prime minister, I don't think you can sort of hide that. I think you have to just be honest with, with, with your boss and with yourself. But what was it about that moment? Because, I mean, you have stuck by Boris Johnson. You've been very loyal to him throughout. What was it about that it was, moment I, that I think my, you over the edge? My doubts sort of started back towards the end of last year with the whole sort of reports around parties and things in, in number 10. Yeah, I had received reassurances around that and, and, and listened, but... Did I you think, believe the reassurance at the time? Yes, yes, I did. And uh, I, had, I did. And, uh, but we, this, with this last week, obviously, we saw you know, new issues around uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's now been suspended from the party. And I think that would probably, for me, was the final trigger. But look, you know, Boris Johnson has decided uh, to resign. As you said uh, in your opening remarks, that once I had been the first to go, a number of my colleagues you know, followed me uh, in that. And now we, we can look ahead. And I am, I am running uh, to be the, now, I'm running to be the next leader but of the Conservative Party. I'm interested in, in why it is now and why you have gone through months and months and months of going out on the airways, of defending the Prime Minister, of, of you say you believe the reassurances. So if you believe the reassurances, were you not naive? Is that a good quality for a future Prime Minister? Um, no, I don't think it's naive at all. I think that, first of all, you know, I think I certainly wasn't the only one. And if anything, I was probably the first one to not believe uh, them. And so, uh, but I think that when you're in government, it's a huge responsibility. We're all bound by collective responsibility. It's about trusting each other. It's about being a team. And, and that, for me, is the, the, uh, from day one, has been the priority. And I think it's important when you hear things, think things that you think might not quite be the case, to give the benefit of the doubt. And I think it's really important because actually walking out of your job is a, is a really big thing to do. And, you know, I have done it once before, and that was, again, was also with, with Boris Johnson. And on that occasion, uh, you know, it was over a, a dispute over my advisors and who I could hire. And, and, and I left, and, and I was proven to be right but for the didn't. reasons I left. And, and so doing it again, you know, it really weighed on me heavily. I, I, you know, to, it's doing something like that again with the same prime minister. So I had to think about it very, very carefully. Integrity is the, the word you use, you have used, yeah. keep using it. You read the Sue Gray report. Why didn't you resign then if, if it is all about integrity? You saw what she said. Because I, I honestly, uh, Sophie, throughout that period, I was giving the benefit of the doubt. And I think... But again, I mean, does that not seem naive? This is an, an official report. Sue Gray wrote that report. She went into it in great detail, yet you gave him the benefit of the doubt. I I think it was the right thing to do, uh, to, to give the benefit of the doubt, because 
If I'd walked out of my job, uh, which I, I believe is one of the most important jobs, the job I had in government, you're know, running our health service, dealing with the impact of the pandemic, you know, the recovery of the NHS, you know, our social care reforms, you know, so many people rely on you. And I took that job very, very seriously. Uh, I, I achieved a lot in that short time uh, that I had working with my team. And I wasn't going to walk out on them and all the people that depended on me so lightly. So, so when you went out on television, when you went out on radio, did you always tell the truth. You were always believed exactly what you've been told by the Prime Minister. You saw all the pictures of the parties. You saw what you read, what had been going on. You were... I, tr I trusted what I was being told. So and you it, told and it the turns, truth. Uh, yes, and I trusted what I was being told. And it turns out some of the things I was told, and I said this quite uh, clearly in Parliament when I made my statement, that didn't turn out to be true. Now, I don't know why someone would have said something to me that wasn't true, but that's a question for them. But I trusted what I was told. And, and that's why I think looking ahead now, this is so important. To, so I do want to be the, the next leader of my party and the prime minister of our great country. But I think the, the next leader, whoever he or she is, there's, there's going to be a need to, ha you know, to show that you have integrity. I think the, the British people want to know that the man or woman at the top can be trusted. I think that uh, people are going to be looking for experience because this isn't an entry-level job. You know, this is, this is a crisis at home, there's a crisis abroad. People are going to want to know that there's experience, and I've, I've got the broadest experience. I've run the smallest department to the largest department. I've run the Treasury. And they also <coughs> want to know that that experience is, is, is going, being used to develop a plan, and I will come and forward they... with a new conservative economic plan because I think that is the absolute priority right now. And they right also now. want to be sure of your judgment. And you yes. stood up in the Commons and you said that you could see why people, that you can see that they have decided people have decided to remain in the cabinet they will have their own reasons it's a choice I know just how difficult that choice is but let us be clear not doing something is an active decision but you actively decided to stay with the Prime Minister right until the very end what does that say about your judgment well, I actively decided to leave the cabinet before anyone else that's what I did and and everyone else after that they followed including the Chancellor and others but I did that first so uh, another question might be why did uh, you know, some 50 other people wait and, and, and they will have their own reasons and I respect their reasons because it was a difficult decision for me, it was difficult for them. But I, I'm, I'm led by making what's right for me. I've got to live with my own values and principles and, and, and that is what I did, I did what was right for me. Right, but now, now that decision is made, we do need to, to, to look ahead and think what, and how do we ahead. deal with the challenges that this country faces because they are immense. Let's look ahead now because tax cuts is your, your big thing. That's what you're, you've come That's out with. That's what I'm talking with. about today. Absolutely what you're talking about today and you are suggesting big tax cuts. You're going to reverse the national insurance increase which was there to fund the health service, which you've been in charge of, and the social care system, so that money goes from that. You are cutting corporation tax back to 15%. It's 19% at the moment. It's supposed to go up to 25%. You're cutting that right back. Income tax comes forward until next year. You cut that next year. Fuel duty cut by 5% already. You're going to cut that further, what, 10%? 10, 10 How much is all that going to cost? Well, first, can I explain why tax cuts are so important? We are in danger. Can you just first of all tell me how much it will cost? That, all of that would cost about £39 billion a year, and I will be setting out, the, in the next few days, a scorecard which will show exactly how all of that will be funded in a sustainable way. So I don't believe in unfunded tax cuts. Yeah, this is a, a funded proposal, and I will set that out in, 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 in some detail. But it's really important, to, I think, to, to explain why this is so important. I am really worried that we as a country are at risk of, of falling into a, a, a slow growth, low growth trap. Uh, we, our, our growth rate has been very low for a number of years. Uh, even before the pandemic, it was very low, but hit by the global financial crisis and other issues. And we need to increase that long-term growth rate. Otherwise, we will not be able to afford the public services that we all depend on. You know, I depended on public services throughout my life. It would, I'm, the reason I'm sitting here today as a candidate for prime minister is because of public services. People relying on those every day today. And we can only and, fund that if we have a growing economy. And this is, is, if I may, this is the essential point. There are some people believe that we can't have growth, we can't have the tax cuts until we have growth. I don't think that is right. I think you must start with the tax cuts <coughs> to kickstart the growth. And it's the not money, just tax cuts, maths, you need more, but you need the tax cuts. And the maths is absolutely crucial here. I'm just looking at yes. the figure you've just given me for all those cuts, national insurance, corporation tax, income tax, fuel duty, you say it's going to cost £39 billion. But, I mean, the OBR says that just simply reversing the increase in national insurance 
and simply scrapping the corporation tax rise, not even cutting it, just scrapping it, that alone will cost 36 billion. So what, that leaves you 3 billion to play with. Where's the rest of this money going to well, come I from? Well, I, I, I didn't include the fuel duty change in what you just said. I, I focused on the, 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 the main ones that you okay. mentioned. And, and it is, you're right, it's about, the corporate, it's about scrapping the increase in the corporation tax. Absolutely, but where, and, where does the rest of that money come from? Well, the funding will come out, and as I say, I will set out more detail. And I think it's really important that anyone that talks about tax cuts sets out exactly how they're going to fund it. So let me I'll just give you the headlines uh, of that. In the, the fiscal rules, the current fiscal rules that we have, which I set when I was the Chancellor, by 2024, there will be what's called fiscal headroom, so basically spending room of about 30 billion. I think the priority of that 30 billion should be tax cuts. I but also, you know yourself, I also, with the fiscal, with, you know that fiscal headroom, that is based on predictions, and those predictions can change very quickly, can't they? So that is money course, in the future. That isn't course. money that's there, that's all, money all, in the future. All, all, and that can change very, very quickly, all, and suddenly it's not there. All tax decisions, all economic policy is based on what you call predictions, OBR, we call forecasting. Of course, of course. And, and let me be clear. This isn't a risk-free way. You know, the, whatever you decide on economic policy has risk, whichever way you go. But the, I think the much greater risk is not having the tax cuts. That's a much riskier route to go down. It's not risk-free. It's a massive risk, isn't it? Well, the greater risk is not having the tax cuts. Because if we don't have the tax cuts, we won't get the growth. And if we don't get the growth, we won't be able to sustain the public services. That's a, first, that's a much greater risk. In, in all my time in government, I've never come across a decision, especially the big decisions, that don't involve risk, one or the other. You're doing nothing is a risk. And so you, you, it, 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 it takes you know, your experience and courage to make the big decisions and to get them right. And my view is very firm on this. We cannot fall into a low growth trap like many other countries have across Europe. We must cut taxes. Alongside that, of course, we must invest in skills and infrastructure. We must change regulations and, and make them more business friendly, including taking advantage of Brexit. All of that has to happen as well. But it starts with tax cuts. If we don't do the tax cuts, uh, not just for growth, but also right now to support people that are uh, uh, dealing with the cost of living challenges, which are immense, then we won't get the growth and our public services will not be sustainable. So you're saying it's a risk, but it will also involve spending. What, where else are you going to cut? You're talking about cutting 1% in Whitehall spending. What, what departments are you going to cut? Which budgets are you going to cut? How much, how much of an impact will it have on, on NHS, on teachers, on schools, on public sector pay? I could answer that. and I will ask Please for, do. by 2024, uh, efficiency savings from every department, including the health department. And let me give you a really practical example about how I believe it can be done. When I came into the health department, I'd been long looking for savings from the health department, by the way, especially when I was chancellor. And I was told there were no, none more. I came to the health department. Within the first four weeks, I identified three quangos that could be scrapped and their functions moved into the NHS, saving 6,000 jobs and £1 billion a year. I did that in the first four weeks. So what's, but what's confusing is that you have been, you've been health secretary and you asked for a tax rise. You wanted this insurance, national insurance hike to pay for health service, for pay for care, and now you're saying that actually you can cut in those departments, that the NHS, you will make cuts in those departments. No, well, I, let me be clear, because I, this is really important that it's understood, you know, as, as, I, as I've set out my plans, <clears> is that what I'm talking about is prioritising tax cuts and part of the funding for that coming from efficiency savings. I believe that in government, with the spending that we've got, that we can have more efficient government and I know how to do it. I've run more departments than anyone else. I know how to do this. I've run the biggest spending department and, and, and I've done it already. Now, going to the levy, because you asked me a very good question about the levy, the, my job as health secretary was to make sure that we had the resources to meet the promises we made on health care and social care. My job was not to decide how to raise it. And that is a tough decision. I respect um, that. But with the current fiscal situation, I believe that we can afford to scrap the levy and still fund all of that increase that was promised. You are proposing a lot of tax cuts, and tax cuts, we know, are inflationary. Does inflation no longer matter? 
It's a, it's a really good question around inflation. Let me, let me be really clear on this. The current issues around inflation we are facing, they are primarily led by global structural factors. The pandemic, the impact on the supply chains, the rise in prices of energy and, and food because of the war in Europe. Whatever we do with our fiscal policy here is not going to change those global prices. That's my first point. So if your I may, government my... will be an inflationary government? No, no, you no will... not at all. Not at all. My second point is that if we, by making these changes, you know, so on work incentives, on the incentives to invest, it could also have a positive impact on the supply side. You know, actually incentivizing, increasing whether it's labour participation and supply. So I think that that is also important. In this, but also, if I just please may bring it back to the point: if we don't do this, it's a much greater economic risk. There's no risk-free way to deal with the economic crisis we face. And, and you need someone in government that has a new conservative economic plan from day one okay. ready to go. I did this with Jeremy Hunt. I'm going to do it with you. Quick questions, yes or no answers. Should refugees be sent, or not refugees, should asylum seekers be sent to Rwanda? I agree with that policy. Would you lock down the country again if there was another pandemic? Not for COVID. But for something else? I, 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 not for COVID. Uh, do you keep the commitment to get to net zero by 2050? Yes. Will you scrap the BBC licence fee? No. Uh, Scottish independence, do you rule that out ever? Would you allow that? Well, the last one was for generation, and so it's, it's, the generation hasn't changed. So, no, not forever, but not, not at least for a decade. Um, honesty and integrity is obviously cru crucial. The word that you have used, integrity, <laughs> over and over again. For how many years were you non-domicile for tax purposes? I think about... Five, four or five years for when, when, was that? when before, before public life. I, it was be in the 2000s. So where were you paying tax at that time? In the UK. Uh, but but, but uh, let me be more specific. You said quick fire, but if you like... No, no, if you, you, can, have, you can answer you me more question. specific, yes. No, no, I, it's, a, it's a really important question. I'm happy you asked. Is that when I, before my public life, I had a job that was very international. I worked at, my first job was actually in the States. So I lived in the States. Then I lived in the UK. Then I lived in Singapore. My tax statuses changed uh, you, with, with a lot of that. And, uh, and that is why my tax affairs were very international. Uh, when I, in 2009, I moved back to the UK and, uh, and ever since then, I've been tax resident, tax domiciled here in the UK. Everything I've ever done when it comes to UK tax affairs has been properly consistent. So where were you paying tax taxes. during that time? I was paying tax in the UK. And I mean, if I lived abroad, I was paying tax abroad. OK. Um, whereabouts abroad? Which countries? I, I lived in my tax residences were uh, the United States. I was a tax resident there. I was tax resident in Singapore. I was tax resident in the UK. And but because I was moving around, there will be you, the, uh, at some points I would, I would also travel a lot for business. That might affect my tax where I might pay tax as well as I move around uh, for business. Uh -huh. It's not unusual for someone's working in the financial world to have an impact on their tax. It's not unusual to have a tax accountant that would give advice on how to make the various tax returns in different jurisdictions. And, 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 and the most important point here, and I think this, this was before my public life, but also very important, is that it was all perfectly consistent at all times and compliant with UK tax law. I've never been investigated for my tax affairs. Fine. So, and the reason I am asking, obviously, honesty, integrity, it's central yes, to your absolutely. leadership. Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm pleased pitch. you asked. Absolutely. Uh, should all candidates publish their tax affairs just so that the British public knows where they stand and you're being straight with the British public? Would you tax... Oh, I have no issue your... with tax transparency and you like would, that. If you I, if, I, I think if, if, if I get in the final two, the final two candidates should be, should be quite open about their tax affairs. Um, you voted Remain. You, uh, to make Brexit a success, do we actually have to change standards? Do we have to, for example, accept hormone-treated beef to get a trade deal with America? Uh, we should change uh, some of our rules and regulations. I think it's a shame that having rightly you know, Brexited and honoured the referendum and, and delivering on that, that we haven't, I, in my view, I don't think we've done enough to take advantage of Brexit. There are many, much of our law, for example, is, is what's referred to as retained EU law. And uh, we should be now reviewing all of that, setting a sort of sunset time on that. Maybe within five years, every department has had to review that, either change it, get rid of it, to force change, to make us a more you know, pro-business, wealth-creating, entrepreneurial economy. I think we should be looking at all that inherited law. So hormone-treated beef, would you allow that to get trade, a trade deal with well, America? Well, look, I, yes haven't, no? I, have, I haven't specifically looked 
uh, at that issue, and I'd be willing to, to, to listen to the argument. OK, Sajid Javid, thank you very much for talking to thank us this you. morning. Now, let's return to our expert panel to discuss what we've heard over the last hour or so. But before that, we just remind you of what both Jeremy Hunt and Sajid Javid have had to say about the key issue of this campaign so far, and that, of course, is tax. Treasury figures show that uh, you get about half the cost of corporation tax back because of increased economic activity. Um, and if we uh, keep the cycle, uh, keep the fiscal rules we have, but increase the length of the cycle to, to five years, we can afford these tax cuts. All of that would cost about £39 billion a year, and I will be setting out the, in the next few days a scorecard which will show exactly how all of that will be funded in a sustainable way. So I don't believe in unfunded tax cuts. This is a, a funded proposal. Sajid Javid there, a reminder of what they were telling us with Ian Dale from LBC, Kate Ferguson from The Sun on Sunday are back with me now. What did you make of it? I mean, I think uh, both our jaws dropped, didn't they, when Jeremy Hunt announced that um, Esther McFay would be his deputy if he was became leader. He said she could be his Prescott. That's definitely his bid to win over Brexiteers and that red wall, isn't it? That, and I think, I'll just quickly say, he's sticking with Rwanda policy. He's bringing Esther McVay in as his deputy and he wants to give big business uh, rates cuts to left behind areas. So that is his big pitch to prove that he's not just a sort of Remainer, Southerner, totally out of touch with the country. He can, he can win over the North too. I think when you have a partnership with another politician, it has to be believable. And it reminded me back in 1997, when there was a leadership campaign then, when Ken Clark allied himself with John Redwood. Nobody believed a word of it. And, I mean, you're right, though, this is a balanced ticket in a sense. Jeremy Hunt appeals to the south, Esther McVeigh from Merseyside appeals to the north. But I think a lot of Conservative MPs are going to think that is a bit odd. And when you're pitching yourself as the, the change candidate that's got nothing to do with the Boris Johnson government whatsoever, and then you also commit yourself to following the Rwanda policy, Again, uh, Tom Tugendhat will have been watching that and licking his lips, I would have thought. <laughs> but then again, I mean, he may support it. I don't, I don't know. But if you're, if you're pitching yourself as the change candidate, it's a bit of an odd thing to do. And what about the tax uh, issues, the tax um, claims and what they're going to do? Do they add up? Well, I think a lot of those claims are going to unravel because, I mean, you had a long conversation there with Sajid Javid about, well, how, how, how does it all add up? And he, he was, I would say, semi-convincing on, on a lot of his answers on that. But on the basis that he and most of the other candidates were sitting around the table when Rishi Sunak was putting up taxes, I wonder how many of them actually put their hands up and said, um, I'm not sure we should be doing this as Conservatives. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I'm sure we'll find out over the next few days. And I think a lot of people will find it confusing. Sajid Javid there, as I was saying to him, there he was, Health Secretary, and he was supporting the rise in national insurance and all of a sudden saying, nope, I'm going to reverse yeah, in, that. In a way, he's got the most uncomfortable um, questioning on that because he kind of banged the drum for tax rises so that he could get the funding he needed as health sec, and now we see that he wants to sort of ditch them. That NICS rise makes raises a lot of cash. I think is it 13 billion a year that you're going to have to now find to keep those NHS budgets flowing. It would be great if you can find them through efficiency savings, as Saj says. Let's wait and see if he actually can. That's a big number. And they're all right saying, uh, yes, we've got to increase growth, because that could get the money. Yeah. Absolutely right. But unfortunately, we haven't got a great track record on that at the moment. Ian Dell, Kate Ferguson, thank you very much for staying with me. Uh, what an extraordinary week in politics it has been. Who knows where we will be by this time next week? But I will be here with the very latest twists and turns. There's more politics on BBC One this morning with Sunday Morning Live and before that, politics where you are. I do hope you'll join me next Sunday. In the meantime, enjoy the sunshine. Goodbye. Aulunatini, Best Nuts, Wolf Alice, Be There.